All right, let, let me begin by making some uh, stage setting comments. Now, instead of the, the usual uh, single or few word title for an exhibition, Robert and I deliberately chose a longer title, uh, one that's more explicit, more challenging, in order to reflect the, the debates that swirl around the, the new art movement that has been emerging from a close collaboration between artists and scientists namely biological, bio, biologically inspired art. And I like to think of that as a subset of what I refer to as science inspired art. And with this exhibition and these debates, we hope to take uh, science inspired art, and particularly in this case, biologically inspired art, up to the, the mountaintop, to the stratosphere. Now like, like cubism, science inspired art is a, is a highly intellectual art movement in that it draws from a number of different disciplines uh, in addition to uh, probing the mind and uh, looking also into such concepts as creativity. So merging art and science, which is the exhibit that you're seeing around here, exhibits a work that explores the meaning of life, uh, the meaning of our bodies, and the meaning of systems that reside on the boundary line between the living and the non-living. Now some of the artists in this, in this exhibition accomplished this with a broad electromagnetic spectrum ranging over magnetic resonance, imaging, MRI, as in the work of Susan Oldworth and Annie Cottrell, who examined brain states and the meaning of the self, uh, to electron microscopy in the study of photosynthesis and plant respiration by Ken and Julia Yonatani, towards restarting a lost conversation with trees as living and breathing spirit, very poetic. <laughs> to the visual image, as in the work of Andrew Carney, who studies how the, the sense of self is disrupted by, the, by introducing an organ of another. And Catherine Dowson, who studies patterns of blood vessels in the brain as they nourish healthy and unhealthy tissue. And Helen Piner, who is concerned with the mystery of biological life and strives to, to, to personalize the corporeal body. And into the abstract, Vanina Sellers, who scans a fictional interior itself made possible with a play of light. And by abstract, I mean that Nina strives to visualize the invisible, and in this way makes contact with another subset of science-inspired art, physics-inspired art, which runs the gamut over the cosmos, from the microcosm to the macrocosm, from, from atoms, which can be visualized only with images generated by mathematics to the stars, which appear to us as quiescent dots on a heavenly canopy, uh, a view which conceals the, the violent paroxysms they undergo when they end their life. They, they can blow up, go supernova, leaving behind remnants which are a black hole or a neutron star, or perhaps they can just blow up, just blow themselves up to smithereens, or the light can go out gradually, as will be the case, with our star, the sun, as it becomes a white dwarf star. Back to Earth, David Marin poetically and metaphorically depicts death. David Angeludu sees in marine <laughs> plankton hanging outside an image strongly evocative of human life. Oran Katz and the Oda Zor ex explore the line between living and inert matter. Stellark declares the human body to be obsolete and goes on to modify it giving us a fascinating glimpse of the future of humankind. And Nel Nina Sellers' photographs of Stellark's extra ear, as you see around here, evoke the aura and mystery of ancient dissections lit only by candlelight, when uh, the uh, physicians would actually put a candle into the cadaver's uh, interior. Now, even though the term art and science is on everyone's lips, uh, we haven't yet defined it, and we don't know yet where it's going. Is it perhaps moving towards a new culture, a third culture? And by a third culture, I mean the fusion of art and science in a yet-to-be-specified way, which will result in a, uh, in a hybrid form of knowledge which will enable us, hopefully, to make uh, advances in such fields as consciousness, and perhaps also allow us to characterize a new culture and even life itself. Uh, in the third culture, discipline, interdisciplinarity becomes a discipline. Now such considerations also raise the question of whether there is a similarity in the creativity of artists and scientists, 
And can we not say that all of this work is a move towards redefining the concept of what art is and of what aesthetics is? Now, in my opinion, new kinds of art are bound to emerge and have done so already. Back in the ancient days of the 1960s, we had uh, kinetic art, com kinetic art, computer art, uh, electronic art, uh, and now that has blossomed into <coughs> techno art, which includes robotic art, light art, uh, new ways of doing sculpture, uh, and this has moved into theater and dance. There's interface art, algorithmic art, sonic art, sculpturing with, sculpturing with sound, information art, and who knows what else. I like to, to think of this as uh, along the lines of who thought 30 years ago that science and technology would look the way they do now, where the interface is becoming very much blurred. At minimum, we hope that a climate, that today, a climate will emerge where artists and scientists inspire one another, where the cultural horizons of the scientists and the cultural horizons of the artists are mutually broadened. Uh, for has it not always been the case that great discoveries in science and dramatic new art movements have emerged from people who have the broadest possible outlook, who see the big picture in art and science, who can make connections between disciplines that others see as unconnected? This exhibit and this series of debates address these key issues of, of the 21st century, among others. Now, uh, a little bit over 50 years ago, C.P. Snow uh, delivered the Reed Lectures at, uh, at, entitled uh, Two Cultures, uh, and it has become one of those uh, events and books, and, uh, and the, his two-culture argument really took off when F.R. Levis, uh, a very narrow-minded uh, literary critic, uh, took off on it. And it's a sort of work now that that everybody, that so many people cite, but I don't believe so many people have read. It's sort of like Sun Tzu's The Art of War. Everyone quotes it, but nobody reads it. Uh, for the most part, it's, it's irrelevant at this point. But one interesting point, there, there is still a rift between art and science, and I think that shows up in art galleries. For example, the Tate Modern, to the best of my knowledge, has never had a show on the interplay between art and science in the 20th century. And as, we, as I recall, in 2009, uh, they did tip their hat towards, the, towards Snow's Two Cultures with a symposium on art and science. I was away. I, didn't, I couldn't attend it. But I have friends who went there who walked out in the middle and made a lot of noise when they walked out. There was only one panelist that had any, in, that had any engagement with the issue of art and science, and that was Jonathan Miller. So that, that brings me to GV Art Gallery. And, uh, uh, Robert Devchik takes an enormous risk in putting on shows of this sort that are purely art and, purely art and science. Uh, you know, it's our beloved uh, field of knowledge, but unfortunately it's still, a, it's still a fringe field. And he puts an enormous amount of, of energy and enthusiasm into it, and indeed he has set up GV Art Gallery also as a place where people interested in art and science, both artists and others, can come and discuss their work. And it has become very much like uh, an, an academy in the days, in the days of, of ancient Greece. Uh, let me now, before I go on and introduce our uh, distinguished panel, just give you uh, a summary of what's been going on before. This is the, the third panel or discussion uh, or heated conversation um, of questions that I pose to the panelists. The first panel um, had some uh, heavy hitters in the field. Uh, Oran Katz, Stellars, and Nina, S and uh, uh, Stellar, perhaps, so, I'm sorry, and Nina Stellars. Um, the question, the panel question was um, to discuss the, the, the third culture, uh, the fusion of art and science in a yet to be specified way. I brought up, I mentioned science inspired art, and immediately everyone's hackles was raised, and you know, is there a hierarchy? Am I intimating that science is above and art is below? Well, no, I didn't. In fact, it never occurred to me. Uh, but the arrow doesn't really run symmetrically uh, these days as yet. There is science inspired art, but I haven't seen much art inspired science. Uh, the point some of the panelists made, and some which a lot of the audience agreed with, disagreed with me, is that uh, art is art and science is science. There has to be, I've never heard this phrase, an integrity of disciplines. Because if you don't have it, 
Then you have scientists producing bad art. You, you get a danger of this, and artists producing bad science. Well, there is lots of cases where scientists have, have produced bad art, that's for sure. But I haven't seen any artists produce any science at all, bad science included. Uh, the panelists then said that they were not inspired by science anyway. Uh, they use science like paint in a can. And some of the audience agreed with that, and I thought that, I thought that was rather strange. And uh, also, just to jump back a second, art is art and science is science. That's a very strange stance to take in this interdisciplinary age. But um, they, we finally, after some argument, uh, they agreed, and so did people, in the, many people in the audience agreed, that uh, they were challenged by science. They were inspired. They were at least challenged by it. Uh, another point that was brought up, which I thought was interesting, is, uh, I guess, is grant envy. I mean, we're all scrounging for grants <laughs> these days, you know, scientists and artists. I guess scientists have a bigger, you know, crack at the gold ring than, than, than artists do. Uh, the claim was made that uh, artists, the, the mind of the artist ranges more freely than the mind of the scientists, because scientists are more constrained by, by grants. Well, uh, that, and I, I thought about this, uh, where, where did this come from? And uh, I, I, my, my insight was that perhaps uh, the artists in the audience were all biologically inspired artists, whatever you want to call it, they did biology art. And so, and biology is, is not a theoretical subject, biology is a lab-based subject. Right now there's no mathematical theory of biology. And so when a biologist uh, obtains a grant, they have to stay within that, that grant um, in, in order, and they must do work that concurs with that grant. Similarly, people in experimental physics also must stay within the confines of that grant. They can't all of a sudden say, well, I've changed my mind. I want to do a different experiment. I'll use that grant money. You, you can't do that. But people in theoretical physics uh, and a mathematical, certainly in theoretical physics, to give a, a, an example from a science, can change their focus a little bit. If you're working on black holes and you become interested in neutron stars or something else, you can shift over. Your, your grant manager will allow you to do this. As long as you don't start writing papers on Egyptian hieroglyphics, you're, you're okay. So I, I think that was the source of the, of the, of the issue there. It was a, uh, a misunderstanding. The second panel uh, discussed uh, two questions. Are there similarities in the creative processes of scientists and of artists and scientists? And as an artist, how deeply immersed in the science must you be? Well, this went around, and uh, the two points that came out of uh, agreement here, that, that the emphasis was art as experimentation. And in this sense, art makes, does make contact, very nice contact with science. As Picasso once said, the artist's atelier is like, is like a laboratory. And then an interesting, uh, interesting points arose of the need for text in a gallery, especially uh, uh, for art and science. Uh, there's no text here. The decision was made not to use it here. But it, it's often helpful, uh, particularly uh, because, I mean, this is Stolarf's arm. It's nothing, and, and so on. Uh, but in physics art, in astrophysics art, which I've become involved in, in, in exhibitions there, you see a blob on a wall, well, somebody has to tell you that's, a, that's a, a science, an artist's rendition of a black hole, or else you think it's some sort of mistake on the wall. So uh, let me next move to um, our distinguished <coughs> panelists. And uh, I'd like them first to introduce themselves. They have agreed to take just two minutes so they can take all night and introduce themselves with the, the distinguished careers. And, and then I'll make a few other comments, and then we'll launch into our discussion. So let me uh, go in alphabetical order. Uh, Andrew Carney first. Yeah, sorry, just dropping something. Yeah, I'm uh, Andrew Carney. Um, the balance of my life is that I'm, I'm primarily a practitioner making work, uh, but I also teach at the University of Southampton in the art school a couple of days a week, um, and that's the balance. Uh, for about 10 years now, I've collaborated, or I don't really like the word collaborated, but I've been involved with scientists in one way or another, um, developing projects. Um, but my history 
earlier than that was that I actually started studying science, kind of soft sciences. I, I started with zoology uh, and kind of moved into psychology and then left completely. Uh, this was at Durham University. So I, I had this kind of interest from the very start in the kind of science area. I then went on to art school um, and then for 15 years didn't really think much about the things that uh, I'd studied and that kind of whole area, which had been a very large part of my life beforehand. And suddenly um, I was beginning to use some of that in the studio. And somebody, the curator, came in and recognised it and things kind of spiralled out of control from there. Um, and I've done that. And I've done lots of different sorts of collaborations, I think. In, in collaborations, again, using that word. But this, having these relationships with scientists, some have been really in-depth and some have been quite slight in a way. And so they lead to different kind of results. Uh, in, in the kind of work that I make. I mean, in, in terms of medium, I mean, I, I started really wanting to be a painter, but I've done sculpture, I've done photography, but the, the main way that, you know, I transmit ideas currently is through time-based media, and I use old-fashioned um, slide projectors in the main and dissolve units, and have very kind of um, long kind of storylines that go through things, and people get caught up in these um, darkened spaces with the, with right. the images. Okay. Great. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, my name is Annie Catchell, and uh, like Andrew, I'm involved with academia too. Um, uh, at the moment, I'm a senior research fellow in sculpture in um, De Montfort University, um, but I teach a bit at the RCA. Um, my background is I come from Scotland. There's a slight hint of Scottish in there still. I've been down here for 20 years. Um, I studied at Glasgow School of Art, then I went to Belfast, then I came and did um, my second MA at the Royal College. Uh, no, it's, it's a long, long story. But I've been working um, with scientific ideas since I was at art school in 1980 in Glasgow. I used to go to the Hunterian there. There's a Hunterian in Glasgow, there's a Hunterian down here. The one in Glasgow wasn't bombed, which was fortunate, so all the specimens are still there. And um, I was very interested in, in making the invisible visible and a kind of felt scene, to kind of put it in a nice little nutshell. Um, the parameters that I, the people I've worked with over the years, um, in a way, like you describe the, the word collaboration, sometimes it feels right, sometimes it feels like just a conversation, sometimes it's a dialogue, sometimes it's coming to a situation like this where I, I listen to somebody speak and I think, gosh, that's interesting and go and kind of further it somehow. Um, so I think it's a kind of trigger and it's a dialogue and I have a very long collaboration over 10 years, off and on, not every day, but with Morten Kringlebach who's written a book called The Pleasure Centre, uh, which I would uh, recommend anybody to read who's interested in um, issues around the brain and he's a neuroscientist. So that's kind of where I'm at, but I do other, I've been on a voyage recently this summer with Kate for a while. I'm interested in how, how work, um, which has obviously an influence or a dialogue with science, can also influence um, issues around kind of, for example, things like climate change, and we're putting on an exhibition in Paris next year there, which references climate change. It doesn't illustrate it, it references it. Well, I'm Catherine Dowson. Um, I've uh, been working on things that are sort of again very similar in the sense to any of looking in, um, looking inside the body. I loved biology as a child, and I remember discovering the tapeworm in a big way, and <laughs> the, the vision of the, the, the hooks and suckers. How do we interpret the, that? Yeah, no, it's, it's, but it um no, it it's all this kind of biology stayed with me, and so by the time I got to art school, I started um doing land art, and then you know going into eventually discovering the Hunterian back down in London, and um it's from then it's just been um, looking within finding out what we're feeling inside us and eventually it's turned out to be a lot more to do with psychology so less to do with the physical um, similarities um, from what's within us to sort of visual things um, and natural things outside to the psychology within us and um, so I've been recently working with uh, cancer patients and the, the kind of stories that they have and their processes and through the medical the hospital environment and um, also about um, holding on to things and letting go of things so again with toys and getting rid of toys that you've um, been hanging on to or your children's toys 
And um, in a way, those have become relics. And so how do you have objects? How can you let go of objects? And what do you have um, with these particular objects around stories? I love stories as well. So. OK, thank you. Well, we, we can certainly say that these people represent the, the extremes of science-inspired art. It's like, the, it's like extreme sports. They, these people push the envelope. Uh, let me uh, throw out a, a, the question that we'll be discussing tonight. Uh, can collaborations between artists and scientists bring us any closer to understanding creativity? And these people will, of course, bring in their own experiences as well. Uh, Annie, do you want to pick it up? Um, well, I had a, we were luckily given these questions before. Um, doesn't seem to make it any easier to answer, having said that. <laughs> I was going to change it. Right? Oh, were you? <laughs> um, and uh, <clears throat> I'm aware of some of the, the, the um, comments that have ha and the discussions that have happened before. And I think um, I'm, I'm not. I can't. I, I feel like I can't really speak for the scientists. If, if that's part of the. Question. No, that's okay. Just, yeah. just speak for yourself. I really can't. Although I have observed um, how people have reacted and how they are creative and so forth. Um, my, my creative process, I think, is pretty broad-ranging, actually, and uh, once I remember giving a talk in Italy, and I was trying to explain how it, how it feels to generate a piece of work, and uh, I felt a bit like Columbo, you know, the sort of the old cop. And it's well, did, did collaborating with the scientists bring out this? Um, well, well part, of that, part of that is to find, is to evidence things, is, is what well, I was trying to use that as a kind of connection that you don't really know but you have a hunch and perhaps part of what artists do as much as anything else is they react to s things in society I mean I remember the very first time I saw an image in a newspaper of a, of a brain scan with an active area within the brain that showed something I can't remember exactly what I was mesmerized and it was on the front page of one of the newspapers and I happened to be at the very same time doing a residency with psychiatric hospital uh, psychiatric patients so the connection there was very real on all sorts of levels. So that was that started off trying to trying to work with um, with neuroscientists. Right. Well, I think well, part of the the um, issue in this uh, exhibit is that we have here artists taking science out of out of the laboratory. Yes. As well. Uh, well, it's in the laboratory. I mean, I've I've um, I primarily work really on my own taking. Um, I do take inspiration from science. Like I have, you know, oh, I, <laughs> it's a bit contentious, I think, in part of these panels. But um, I see things, and, it's, and I, I then it sparks something inside me that I want to make this. So, I mean, for me, um, sculpture is about problem solving. I mean, I have this Im image, this vision in my head of what I want to create, and it's just then how do you get to that final piece? And of course, things change along the way. <coughs> but, um, and so I've noticed with scientists, they, um, they observe problems, and then they kind of result, you know, it's then their work is actually resolving that problem. And artists, we create our own problems, and then we <laughs> kind of, you know, um, struggle to actually resolve them. But then when I've been um, um, collaborating with scientists, or just watching them, I'm observing their yeah. observations. Yeah. And so, um, and I do, I mean, I think there's, you're saying, you know, whether we can, the nature of creativity, but I mean, I think scientists are, you have to be creative as a scientist to actually get to the end result mm -hmm. because you're inventing all sorts of ways. And also, the, in the same way, things spark. Yeah, you know, two, two things that, that emerge yeah. that are very interesting. First of all, it's not often realized that art is a problem oriented activity, just as science is. And a hell of a scientist, the, the really top scientists, the, the Einsteins and the Bohrs, sticking to the 20th century, uh, do discover a problem, uh, yeah. uh, fundamental to creativity, high creativity, is to discover a problem, not just work on a problem that everyone else has been working on. And Picasso did that, for example, in art. Andrew, do you want to? Yeah, there I mean, seems, seems to be quite a lot to say. I mean, you know, going back to your point about, I mean, I mean, I'm very inspired by science. I mean, I think the ideas that come through science are really important. The, the, the creative part of both science and art seems to be, I mean, it is impenetrable. I mean, you get insights into it, I think, kind of when you meet different people, and I've, I've met a lot of neuroscientists, so there are bits of things that kind of tell me about my creativity. And I come from this background of, um, in a sense, you know, the psychology as well of things. And having that as a kind of background made, made me feel things. So, you know, kind of when I'm making work, I think one of the important things is a kind of open 
aspect to the work. And I'm always curious about the scientists because they seem to be quite closed in the sense they have a question to answer and it's very, very narrow. And they're trying to do that. Whereas I'm trying to open something up and I think a lot of it is about where the question is posed and what you're trying to do. They're trying to kind of find or understand things and find knowledge and there's something fixed that they're looking at. I suppose I'm trying to find something that communicates with other people and in the dimension of this, the social aspect of it and trying to find an, another kind of well, how, meaning. How does science inspire you how in this process? I think it's the topics really. It's, it's just the ideas. I mean, when I you know, first started with um, Magic Forest, I mean, you know, I was, I was kind of back looking at neurology and suddenly I was in the lab and, I, and, I, and I'd done biology and stuff at, at college and whatever and school. And I, I think I came away at the age of 19 with the notion that the brain was a kind of static thing. It was a kind of fixed wire thing. It was a bit like a house and it had various circuits and it did this. And suddenly I was in the lab and Richard Wingate was showing me these videos of the brain, you know, developing and changing. And then I um, went um, to Queen Square and met and talked with Eleanor Guire. And she was just starting on the taxi driver experiments at that point where they were testing um, you know, taxi drivers about the knowledge and they realized that the was areas of the hippocampus that were growing and developing. They had you know, very large hippocampal areas and this was all to do with mapping. Uh, they did similar experiments with people, uh, bus drivers who, uh, who, who do, um, you know, drive strict routes and they don't have the same development. So this whole kind of sense of difference and change. And these were the people that were coming to taxi drivers quite late in life. So there weren't this kind of, it wasn't this 19 year old static kind of in concrete brain. Suddenly it was a kind of living, growing, changing thing. And, and that's what inspired me. I mean, no, just, just okay. the fact that it, it, that it was changing, that it wasn't, it wasn't kind of morbid, it wasn't mm-hmm. stuck. It was this incredible process that's going on now, that goes on all the time, that goes on, you know, till we die. I mean, right. we can learn and okay, that, that was inspiring. Yes, yeah, okay, sorry. Okay. Uh, um, uh, both of you work with, with scientists as well. and. Uh, uh, you say you're both inspired by art. Are you inspired by the way scientists deal with problems, the way they either discover a problem or work on an already existing problem? And did you find any parallelisms with the way you work on a problem? Um, I, think, I think I would say that the, the, the people I've worked with, it's, it's extremely structured and um, my problems are quite broad ranging, <laughs> in the sense that I, I as, as I think you say, you, you set yourself these kind of challenges perhaps, whether they're problems, but they can become problems, but I, th- I think they're distinctly different, I think there's a very different motivation to be honest, I think it's a different set of criteria. So is it, is it different sort of creativity also? Or I don't know, I don't know if it's different, it, it um, wouldn't, I don't, uh, I think there must be commonality there, but um, it's a quite a private activity quite a lot of the time. I get the impression mm-hmm. from Morton that when he's working, it can be when the children have gone to bed or during the day or whatever. And I don't know when his kind of moments of lucidness come. But, you know, but we've, we've done things together like I, he's invited me to go and watch brain surgery. And we've had conversation, wonderful conversations in the theatre about what's going on. And, you know, I was very fortunate the, the actual sur- surgeon allowed me to kind of... Um, Stick your finger Feel the tumour, yeah. I did. The, op- the option was there. I put my finger in. It was once the tumour was out. I was allowed to, to um, if I wanted to, and I just decided that I would do it. And I found it quite disturbing, um, because it reminded me of something else. And as uh, much as anything else of where it had been and the implications of what it meant to that person to have had that tumour, and so forth. So you know, um, that those those were very very. I think. There is there's something very experiential about going through something so intense with somebody, and I think we maybe maybe our dialogues in the in the surgery in the theatre were were very significant. Um, yeah, uh, uh, but, but, but biology art is very materialistic. It's it's out there. And, uh, we do have one person here who does physics uh, art right, presently, and uh, maybe in, in the uh-huh. next round she can say something. But I mean, uh, there is a difference. Uh, uh, what if you couldn't uh, touch what you were working on? I mean, how would that? I think it's fine. I mean, it, that, I mean, you know, making sculpture is is a very tactile thing. It's not all about touch, but I think there's something about re- representing something into the real world again that has gone through a process. In my, the case of the way that I've been working recently, um, you know, through the computer digitally and then built in a kind of in a particular way. That, that's actually quite important. That it's put back into the world. It's not a sort of uh, an image of it. It's actually 
reposition. That's a very big issue. And yes, both of you do rapid prototyping. No, you, you no, I do. Yeah. Oh, you do? Yeah. Yeah. You, no, I've, I've used um, laser. Yeah, I, I said, yeah, I know, I thought you used yeah. laser. They both involve using yes, laser, yeah. actually, yeah. weirdly yeah. enough. Yeah. But um, the kind of technolog technological advances, which mm. are quite stimulating, right, 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 too, yeah. actually, yeah. Mm. But I mean, mm. when I've worked with scientists, it's, um, I've done, it's in certainly the psychologists. So I mm. use my, um, as a sort of bait, I use my own, I sort of, um, as a guinea pig. Mm -hmm. So they scanned me um, looking at words. This was for a dyslexic project about dyslexia and um, researching in dyslexia for the show Head On at the Science Museum. And um, they more, you know, the, being in this um, MRI scanner, fMRI scanner actually, for it was an hour and a half, and just having these words flashed up at me the whole time sort of reminded me about, um, I'm very dyslexic, reminded me about um, all this testing as a child that you go through, endless testing, um, and still you were being tested. And um, they morphed my brain with 10 others, and I think they got more funding to go and research more. Mm. But I did, at the end of that, get um, my um, brain scans, and um, in subsequent work I've been using those actually. But it was um, the psychologists, they were, it, it, it's all computer based. It's all around computer based, and they see these images. And, um, you know, the endless question about whether artists can help scientists in any way, or they've been. I mean, all I can say is that um, the dialogues I've had with psychologists, um, particularly one, um, Gabri Gabrielle Jordan, you know, she's found it very interesting the way I think and how she thinks. And so we can have a discussion, and I will talk about things in a way that she hasn't thought about and will make her think, I mean, in a diff slightly different way. No. Um, with the dyslexic um, Piers Cornelison, who I worked with, he um, had images on the computer. And it, because it's very easy to, s you know, to be looking at something and not seeing it. And so I was saying it was very similar to um, how these images, how he was producing it, it was very similar to um, weather maps you know, because um, because he was doing concentrations all over the brain, and it looked exactly like weather maps. And he'd never thought of that before. And then it started him thinking about the brain and um, words and where you know the, the where things were going on in the brain in the sense of a weather map. Right. So yeah, you know, I mean, not yeah, different ways of seeing <laughs> hasn't changed his life. Ways of seeing the same thing. Um, Andrew, do you find that the, the scientist's way of approaching problems uh, has affected your own thinking? Why they affect? I mean, the, the one experience that I can kind of share, I suppose, is is it was quite interesting. With one of the projects, after doing Magic Pulse, I went on to do another work called um, uh, Complex Brain Spreading Arbor. And um, Richard and I, Wingate and I started on a completely different premise. We had more time and more money to do the project, so we were kind of working more closely on how it should be developed. Mm -hmm. And it was a sort of insight into one of the differences between us, in a sense, in the kind of creative, because we were therefore both trying to make a, a kind of work of art. And it was quite interesting that Richard seemed to close the ideas down very quickly. We, we were both interested in early uh, cinematography as well, and zoetropes. And Richard instantly kind of seemed to settle on that, as that's what he wanted to do, and that's what he wanted to make. And, and, that, and I found that really difficult because he had a very fixed idea and I think one of the things in creativity is to leave things as open as possible for as long as possible because better ideas come up and so one of the things I do is, in terms of being creative is try to um, make points and then you know they're quite high points hopefully and be quite good bits of work, works of art but then it's the kind of joining them together and finding something in between that's, that's even better, that's more exciting, that says more about so the I, get, I, get the, the, I get the, the feeling that the, the, the three of you see scientists thinking narrowly on a problem with a, a definite focus while artists think no, very I broadly. Think that narrow sounds, uh, I mean, I think it, it's a focus, it's a, it's, a, it's a different kind of aim. We're trying to have a different aim, yeah. don't we? We're, we're kind of dealing with the social world. We're taking that data in a sense, and I think of it as a data set, as the access to the data in science, and utilise that, that and, and communicating that in a different kind of way. Yeah, very precise. Very precise. Mm. They so want they to know the answers. Yeah. You know, there's, there's a lot of questions about, well, why are you doing that? You know, and at the time you're not quite well, sure. Well, artists sometimes want to know the answer to a problem. Oh yeah, but but there's a whole thing, there's a whole mm. journey you've got to go through mm. to get there, and scientists have a different. Uh, it's also a different language. Um, so because there's an as, there's an aspect where, where, where talking to scientists is that they feel as though they can't, you know, the ones I've spoken to can't can't be too speculative as well. They're very yes. involved in this kind of area, 
and actually as the artist, I mean, they enjoy those conversations because you can say something quite silly, is it like that? Mm. And they say, well, yeah, that's what I think it is, or that, that might imply that. And so there's the kind of, the interesting things about the dialogues have been that openness about yeah. them. Well, the two, interesting, they yeah, two, interesting, two interesting things came out of it. Number one, uh, speculation. I mean, scientists do, I mean, unless they're working on a really narrow problem, they do speculate. But the notion of language has become, uh, has come up in, um, recently. Uh, it is, some people claim that there could never be a third culture because uh, the language of the artist and the language of the scientists are so different. Well, no, I mean, I mean, I think there's no mapping of one on the other. Do you, do you believe that? I think, I mean, the, the language is such, I've noticed that when scientists are talking to me, because I'm an artist, I'm not a scientist, therefore I'm not a threat. So they tend to be more open and let their guard down. So they will start talking in a much more kind of open way than would I would naturally talk to another scientist because then they you know they're on their guard. There's all the sort of you know rivalry. Yeah, but it's, an inter it's an interesting point, isn't it? Mm. Because um, we're constructed in some way as particular things through our experience and through our education, and maybe that's kind of crux to it in a sense about how we're trained. <laughs> our brains are being trained to think in certain kinds of ways, and scientists are being trained in, in certain kind of ways, and it's like training different sorts of athletes in a way. And but do you, you think know, if, you, if you do rowing, you can't, you, yeah. you, know, you can't do basketball. There are different qualities that are involved. But do you in those think there can be a training that can turn out somebody that? Uh, knows the art jargon and knows the science jargon yeah, too. It's possible. The, yeah. the two, it's like it's like becoming bicultural. Yeah, well, really. I, I, I don't know French and German scientists. become bicultural, yeah. probably. A lot of the, I mean, you know, there's certain artists here who actually were trained scientists. Mm -hmm. yeah. So. Yeah, I think I think you I think, <laughs> you, can, I think you could. Uh, I mean, again, but something seems to happen. Though. It comes down to the it comes down to your grant yeah. question. I think right. and money. I think a lot of people would like to be more embedded in both in both fields, but it's it's very difficult to manage in a in a lifetime in a sense. I guess I, I guess what I'm saying about about training in art mm. and training in science is that somebody uh, will emerge in this hypothetical right in a hypothetical third culture uh, who is at let's say a PhD level in science and a, a very high level in art as well not just undergraduate training um, and in that way could it be the case that this language problem which is some people as I said brought it up bring it up very seriously I think it's a red herring but uh, can translate you can have a translation from one to the other. Not only a translation, but you can also become bicultural, and that's the true somebody who but is when using you say very high language. Of science, you mean because I'm, I'm thinking mm. to myself that what, one of the, the things of even within the arts is the visual language. Mm. The, the, the it's not about a sort of a sort of uh, verbal language. Yeah. Science has become very very visual now too. Yeah. I think they have, and they yeah. always have been. I mean, you mm -hmm. look at Faraday and his right. wonderful books, and mm -hmm. and um, amongst many other. Yeah, no, I think it's it's. Uh, but I think there there are something that goes on if we're talking about education in an art school or if somebody's studying science. If, if you if even if you spend time making art for ten hours a day, mm -hmm. you, there's just so much more that you are. Um, I'm not saying that there, there's a lots of very sophisticated. Um, sophisticated uh, um, visual um, scientists who appreciate art. Not, it's not about that, but um, y you, you're, you're heightened. It becomes heightened if you do that for such a long time. It's just like you're talking about athletes. If you if you row for ten hours mm -hmm. a day, you you develop an aptitude. Mm -hmm. if, if, you, if, if you have the aptitude, yeah. if you, yeah. I mean, you develop um, the ability if you have the aptitude. Yeah. Can, can you think of a, a way that art can be redefined? in the future as well, in that, uh, I mean, art is constantly being redefined anyway, so is aesthetics, but redefined uh, by somebody who has uh, an education, because what, like with, with C.P. Snow, it was really down, down to education. I mean, if Britain wanted to catch up with the rest of the world in the, in the, about the 1950s, education would have to be revamped. And so in a revamping of education, we have a, an art science curriculum which is developed equally in both, in both subjects. I mean, what can you imagine what could so go on see, one, of, one of the questions I have about a complete kind of link is, I mean, for me personally, if I was to spend that long in one science lab, where else would the art go? I mean, you know, it, it, it seems to me that I'm glancing into the art, I mean, into the science, and coming away with an idea that I want to make a work about. But I don't know how many times I could go into the same lab and come up with the same inspiration. So I found that I flip between different kind of 
topics, you know, neurology, you know, doing something on epilepsy, doing, doing something on autism, and now I'm looking, working with a heart transplant team. You know, it, it's, it's that kind of thing. It's coming in afresh, coming away with an idea that I want to make something about. And that's, that's one of the, the problems I have about a, a, a kind of third way of doing things. You know, how embedded would you be? I, th I th think you might run out of ideas. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, I mean, one doesn't know what thing, how things will turn out. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, it could be, I mean, scientists now sit longer and longer in front of computers, uh, solving problems on screen. Mm -hmm. So there may be some logic of images, which doesn't exist at, at the present time. One can deal with images, just manipulate images, and, and what, what emerges will be considered to be beautiful, aesthetic, um, perhaps. But do you, do you think that the the aesthetic notion of the scientist that you work with, I know you work, you, you work with biologists, has, uh, changes at all? The aesthetics of what they do, the aesthetics of how they look at a problem, of how they think that they will they will solve the problem? Well, the, certainly the psychologist I was working with, um, mm -hmm. she started, um, we were talking about the nature of color and um, how color um, can affect moods. And um, by dis having this discussion with her, she started doing those, um, a series of experiments with students led about again with colour and, and perception. Um, she, um, yes, she got quite creative in the sense of how she of looking at aesthetics. Yes. Yeah, she she was she's she's not from an I would say an aesthetic background, um, but she um, artists have come into that department, and I would say I mean she um, she loves it. Because it adds something to her her day, really, if nothing else. Yeah. What you say that? Well, there was there was just one one sort of anecdote was when while we were working together, Morton and I um, making these three D renderings for a piece called Sense, and uh, one of the things that he commented on, and I have to say here that he studied architecture before he became a neuroscientist, so he's very sort of three dimensional, th thinks very three dimensionally. Um, but he, he said that once I'd finished making the piece that he found it very interesting because of the th three-dimensional map and mapping allowed him to kind of see his work one in a different kind of way because it never came out of the computer generally speaking but it was also about the absence of stuff visual stuff as well as the actual uh, thing itself the actual kind of um, sculpture the, the, the rendering within this kind of, it's hard to describe without showing you an image, but anyway, the point is that there's these, these kind of blobs inside a sort of transparent kind of matter, um, resin. And he said what it was like when you're trying to map something, which they often do in neuroscience, um, the, the areas that you're kind of looking for are what they call where be dra here be dragons, which is a, is a term that they used to write on old maps where when they didn't know what was there, and so he sort of said that it was helping him um, think about what he didn't know and, what he, and, and the spaces that he didn't uh, know what happened in those spaces within the brain, as well as what did happen. So right, you know, that was one of his, right, his, his anecdotes yeah. of, or his reactions to the piece. I think, Which I thought was quite interesting, whether that's an aesthetic one or not, I don't know. I think another thing about the interest in aesthetics, I mean, as artists, you, you learn quite a lot about aesthetics, but about the structure of aesthetics as a kind of language of a particular time. And I've been quite struck with the scientists that, in a sense, they've been locked into a way of working and, a, and an aesthetic of presenting the work, for instance, what they do visually. So, the, you know, to, to me, you know, a, a PowerPoint design comes from somewhere, it has a history, it's of that moment. But that's quite interesting that scientists often, you know, seemingly to me, don't recognise that. You know, they haven't got a graphic sense of where the imagery they're using comes from, which is quite an interesting kind of question. Actually, if, if I may uh, add that, uh, uh, here's a distinct difference between research in biology and, let's say, in physics, where there is an aesthetic, um, a, a sense of beauty, a sense that if you have uh, a set of equations and you change certain elements in these equations and the equations remain the same, that, that means that there's a, a certain symmetry in nature and the equations are considered to be beautiful. So symmetry is, is an overriding. Mm -hmm aspect in, uh, in, in physics. Okay, let me uh, uh, end now this, this discussion, which I'm sure has planted many questions in the minds of, of the audience, and let's, uh, the, the cameramen have to reload now, and so do we. So let's, <laughs> let's proceed out to uh, the bar and return in, say, 20 minutes. Okay, but thank you very much.